Speaking of impactful moments, I had one while attending the China Entertainment Technology Summit in Beijing during my presidency. In truth, I had several, but the one that is relevant today focuses on the ability that US ITT membership provides to meet industry colleagues far and near. Through such encounters, if we allow ourselves to be open to perspectives, experiences, and approaches of others, our own lives and work can be enhanced. Little did I know how true that would be when I met Tupac Martyr, who was also a presenter at the summit. But to describe him as a presenter does not do him justice. And even though most of the other attendees were experiencing his presentation through a translator, he was captivating. Tupac is an artist with no boundaries. He has created lighting and projection for Beyonce and Elton John. He has designed fashion lighting for Vivian Westwood, Alexander McQueen, Gucci, and others in London, Paris, and Milan. He is a composer who's written his own opera. He was the creative director of MTV Latin America, and frankly, he is the only person I know that is more energetic than our own executive director, David Grindle. <laughs> Dare I say it, he is indefatigable. <laughs> Ladies, and <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my friend, Tupac Martyr. Right. Good evening, everybody. Good well, morning. Sorry, I'm in London time. Um, let me just do a little bit of clean up before we start. Otherwise, it can get messy. Yes, I know, I work with technology and my voice is still killing me. Anyway, um, just by, I would say, a rise of applause, but um, I'm going to assume that nobody knows what I do, which is great. Uh, my name is Tupac Martin. I was uh, born in England, raised in Oxford, Cambridge, Mexico City, Milan, Baltimore, and somewhere in there I got lost in the world. Um, I, I went to school in Omaha, Nebraska, and everyone goes, what? Nebraska, hell yeah, love O-Town. <laughs> um, Omaha gave me one of the best experiences I've ever had in my life, and not only was I uh, with an amazing team of soccer players, but um, it gave me the opportunity to meet uh, the person that I always thank to this moment for my life and everything that happens, and that is John Thien. Um, I know he's not here, he's, he's my professor, I love him to pieces, the man gave me every single piece of advice, but also all the tools that I needed to do and to use across my life. Now you have to understand, I'm a painter. When I go to bed, I go to bed as a painter. I started with a camera when I was 15 years old. My mom thought it was cute for me to have a camera in Europe. And she said, yeah, have it this, you're going to travel. Little did she know that 25 years later, this is what I do for a living. Um, John, for me, and this goes to everybody that's a student, and I would like you to give a round of applause to all your professors, because you don't know the tools that they're giving you that are going to allow you to live for the rest of your life. So how did I get here? Um, so just a quick one. Usually I do this in like 90 minutes, so I'm going to step through it really quickly. Um, so I studied painting. I moved to Mexico City. I started working for the Opera House. When I was working for the Opera House, um, I was very good because I would just fix stuff. So um, they ended up hiring me as an associate and assistant for people. And when I became an assistant, I assisted everybody. And I mean, I assisted the lighting designer, the video designer, the set designer, the costume designer. Then I went to the production the director, the makeup. And then one day, I was sitting in the back of a room, putting makeup on the growing of a male dancer. <laughs> and I realized there was something wrong. <laughs> like, I studied painting, you know? I make murals. I don't do that. So as I asked the guy to move his crotch a little bit to the left, I took an epiphany and I said, you know what? Forget this, I'm quitting. I quit the opera. Um, I started working in events. Eventually, I'd return to the opera house. Um, somewhere in between, I got asked by MTV to become their art director. That was before reality TV. Um, and then one day in 2007, I finished a show for 25 million people. And I went back to my room. And, you know, you know how it is. You finish a job, you're like, tired, haven't slept for 52 hours, I want my mom, 
but I also could see my ceiling. And I could see that for me to get to where I wanted to be, um, I will have to step on my own friend's toes. I will have to maybe not backstab them, we'll try to steal jobs from them. But I also realized that that was not my call. That I, I, I had this idea of what I wanted to do, and by God, in my head, it was amazing. So I, I took a decision, and I, I decided to go back to London, because that's where a lot of the designers that I like are. And I wanted to prove myself to them. So in 2008, uh, a client of mine, as a gift, said, what do you want? you want me to buy your car? And I was like, no, buy me a ticket to London. I didn't tell anybody I was leaving. Um, I wanted to see if I could actually make it with the people that I thought I could make it. And uh, that pretty much puts us to where I am now. This is a little of my work. <laughs> Mártir. Tupac no desconoce los proyectos de enormes dimensiones. Ha diseñado producciones para Elton John, Beyoncé y Sting. Tupac Mártir produce el set para los grandes modelos del mundo. Концепция показа Маквина была построена вокруг Тайвика. Маквин занимался им, и я к слову тоже. When you go to a concert and you take the picture in the middle of the show, what are you taking the picture of? Are you taking the picture of the music or are you taking the picture of the stage? If it's a crazy big idea, that's what I like to do. So that's uh, that's part of my job. Um, when I when I think about design. When I think about being an artist, um, I always go back to this quote by Eduardo Galeano. Being a Latin American kid, sorry, that's all you read. And uh, you know, he, he, he tells you about how prisoners and how we tend to communicate in every possible way we can. You know, whether it's with music, whether it's just tapping on something, we have this beautiful nature of communicating. And for me, design is exactly that. Um, I'm not here when I'm brought into a show, a job, a fashion show, to just make things look pretty. If that's my purpose at that moment, by all means, I will. But I'm always trying to find and think that every single element that I design into a production has something extra for it. It might be that I enhance that exact moment in which I tell you the backstory just by the way that the sheer light is coming from the right side. Or it might be that the video conveys all the way to the top. Every single element that I put in the design has more of an intricate thing than just being pretty. I'll leave that to myself. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> um, really quick one. I always uh, like to go through this one really quickly because um, it kills me. Uh, a few years ago, here's my issue. You go to a show, and you watch a show, and I show you just you know, a couple pictures, and can anyone tell me what show it was? Of course not. Unfortunately, technology has taken this bit in which you think that just by the sheer fact that you put a bunch of lamps there, that's a show. That's not a show. That's just putting a bunch of stuff there. 
Don't get me wrong, manufacturers, I love you to pieces and keep making amazing stuff. But me and my friend Dan Hadley have this thing about calling it trade show show. You know, you show up to the show and you think you're, and all of a sudden they do, woo! And then, woo! And you go, I've seen that in a trade show. And, and, and I know that sometimes the audience can be dumb, but they're catching up to us. What you see in that trade show are tools for you. The most important thing is to know that you are the person that decides. Technology serves you, not the other way around. I have a quick anecdote about my friend Bambi, a lighting designer out of Israel. If you've never seen him, please go and check him out. He's amazing. He's like my dad. And then one day I was sitting with him, and no disrespect to Clay Packy, but he comes to me and goes, Tupac, uh, do you know who designed Sharpie? And I went, well, Bambi, it was Clay Packy. He goes, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, but you know person designed Sharpie. And I go, uh, no, I don't. Probably someone from R&D. He goes, well, Tupac, if you ever meet men create Sharpie, kill them. <laughs> he took lighting 10 years back. Even producer asking for Sharpie look. And it's the truth. Um, when you look at something like that, you go, I've seen that board before. It's in every single street of my city or town or whatever you want to call it. The most beautiful thing about that is when Olaf put them all together into the Tate Modern and did that. Ooh, that one. I sat at the Tate Modern for five hours looking at that. And I thought the sun was talking to me. And I could see everybody around me. And it was just so cozy. You just sitting there going, ah. Sun in London, who knew? A <laughs> um, couple of years ago, or more than that probably, um, I was invited to go to the, um, one of the rehearsals of the opening ceremony. And uh, when I saw this moment, I was like, this is amazing. You can feel the drums. And you go, oh, look at that. Yeah, hit it, hit it. The place is changing. Amazing. Yeah. A couple of days later, I saw the opening ceremony just across the street from the, um, from the stadium at, uh, at the VIP of the IC. And uh, as it came up, I told them, I was like, this is going to be amazing. You're going to feel it. You're going to feel it in your heart. And then I realized that technology had failed Danny Boyle. Because all those beautiful things that I felt when I was in the stadium were lost. And he wasn't able to transmit that idea to me. At the same time, when I saw this part, I was sitting there and I couldn't understand it. I couldn't see anything. I was looking at screens. It didn't touch me. But when I saw it on opening night and Emily Shade was singing, and Akram is moving, and his 30 dancers are coming across with him, and you see that camera rotating. He had me. I was rust in tears, thinking, now he's, now he's used technology for the good. Now he knows, and he's pushed me to that level where I know the pain that he's feeling. We go back eight, four years before that, Chinese Olympics, and I don't know if you guys remember this, but it was all, all the Taiko drummers going and counting down the seconds and the, the, the merging of technology and human beings interacting as one, just pushing it. I was like, this is amazing. I know it can only be done in China, but this is amazing. <laughs> you had us all in Trafalgar Square trying to figure out how they were doing it. And then this happened. Oh, not that, that. Um, and when we saw those things going up and down, up and down, up and down, everyone's going, it's kinesis, no, it's going to be this, no, no, it's going to be elevated, it's going to be that. And then it turned out, when it finished, that like 1,200 Chinese people just came out of the boxes and started waving. <laughs> and I was like, that's humans. How cool is that? <laughs> you know, the power of the human being is amazing. The power of using... Um, so they had technology because they all had in ears calling someone. Can you imagine someone just like at home? Because you know all of you, when you're rehearsing a show, you know the songs or the music or the lyrics or the script is going through your head and you're reviewing what you have to do. Now, can you imagine the Chinese guys going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, 
My point in this is uh, we tend to use technology in all sorts of ways. It doesn't have to be top-of-the-line technology. Um, I also love to go back and dig back into what I could do. I was doing a pitch for, for a brand, and uh, I put all my guys in 48 hours. I was like, all right, everybody, we've got 40 hours to put this pitch together. You look at optics, you look at this, you look at that, you look at that. And then eventually we came to this, which anyone would think we did in After Effects. When in reality, this liquid crystal inside my overhead projector and on one side, I have the camera looking from the top. And on the other, I'm heating it up. And then eventually, I cool it down. And I create a beautiful pattern. If I ask any of my guys in the studio to do that in After Effects, they will kill me. <laughs> so, what's my point about all this? And it's that if you let technology happen, that's what happens. <laughs> uh, so I'm known for fashion. I'm going to scroll through this one really quickly. I'm known for fashion because basically I love to pay for my sins. Um, a few years ago, I got asked to do this show for Matthew Williamson, and I went and talked to everybody, and I said, okay, we're going to Royal Opera House. How can I do something different than Royal Opera House? Because everyone uses the Royal Opera House. And they told me how people used to put the lighting and the video and all that. So I decided in the middle of rehearsal to go, who owns that building? And they said, the police station. I went, can we go and talk to the police? They're like, too bad, you're always in touch with the police. Uh, yeah, I'm in speed dial. Um, so eventually they got me, they hired me this place. I put six lamps on the other side. And my whole point of it was I wanted people to walk into a room and not see a single light and yet create an environment. Matthew got mad at me because that picture got retweeted about a thousand times. More than the show. Um, I'm lucky enough to work with a beautiful man. If you do costume, please look him up. Thomas Tate, my God, he's a genius. His pattering is sweet, beautiful. I've known him for six years. I've done every single show he's ever done. Um, he, you know, I, I can't tell you more about this lovely human being. But one day, you know, we, we're known for doing weird stuff for shows. Um, so we were doing this show, and as you can tell, there's no catwalk. Um, there's no photographers, because I shoved them all to a different place. It's like, you get in there. Uh, fought them all to the other side. And then uh, people were sitting there. Sah Hadid was there. Kanye West was there. Anna Winter. And they were all just staring at each other going, what's going on here? Eventually, music starts coming up. And it's super industrial. Boom, 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 boom. And then, you know, it was Q1, so turn off the lights. And I literally had to go to a switch and went, uh, uh. And I turned all the lights manually. Then I left them all in the dark for about two and a half minutes. Now, these are fashion people. They're just going... What the hell's wrong with this place? <laughs> now, somewhere in between, an industry magazine wanted to come and cover a fashion show. And I said, you know, come to some estate. Um, Chloe, my MD, went, uh, Tupac, can you uh, give them the kit list? And I was like, I can't give them a kit list. I'm like, why? Don't you know what you're going to do? It's like, I know exactly what I'm going to do. But if I tell them the kit list, they're not going to come. Uh, so eventually, they came. And they're in there. And I'm turning off lights. And everyone's in darkness. And it's a beautiful moment. And then... After two and a half minutes, the first model comes out. And I trace her across the entire space, creating a catwalk that does not exist. The entire place was ephemeral. It didn't exist. You had to look at the clothes. You had to be always looking at them. And they were coming and going in the silhouette. When it turned out and we finished, I had six source fours and three projectors. The magazine was going, if I had known that was much, I wouldn't have come. And I was like, I know, but you came for that. You came to see the final product. What's up there doesn't really matter. It's what's down here. It's what I'm making you feel. I had Saha Hadid come to me and actually give me a hug because she loved it. I had Kanye West and I went, ah! <laughs> I want to be a Christian Jew. I'm known for my McQueen show. This is, uh, it, it, I, I, I'm very grateful I got to work with Lee um, for those that have ever seen this show. Um, this show has meant the world to me. It's given me a life <laughs> in fashion. Um, it was the weirdest thing you've ever seen in your life when you see these women walking with those shoes like that and you're going, someone's gonna fall, no one fell, I lost a bet. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, if you, if you ever have a chance, uh, go back to McQueen. It's, it's lovely, it's amazing, he's incredible. Um, I, 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 it always hurts me to know that he wasn't here for one of my greatest moments in life uh, because I thought that he would have loved it. Um, 
So yeah, that's, that's that. Um, now I want to talk to you about unique. Now some of you might have come from that side and might have heard a bit of a loud noise coming through the foyer. And you haven't? Go over there. It's loud. And I love it. Um, in 2014, Creighton University called me and said that they were going to start programming the 50th anniversary of the arts program at school. And they wanted uh, me to come back as the best artist to ever graduate from, from the school. So I said, great. And back in my head, I wanted to write a graphic novel. Uh, but it wasn't a normal graphic novel. It was, uh, it was a very intricate way of seeing myself. For the past 10 years, I've been questioning who I am. When I close my eyes, who exists within me? When nothing is moving, when I'm just still, what, what is it that really makes this body of thing that moves around? Um, but I also started questioning why, as a society, we, we can sympathize with people, but we don't really empathize anymore. And, and I started looking at why that was happening. And, and so for nine months, I would get up at 5.30 in the morning and write from 5.30 to 7.30 every single piece of thing that came to my head. Now, some of it was amazing. Some of it scared the bejesus out of me. It was very introspective. And then after about nine months, I had 120 phrases. Now, you can understand, I would write every single day, edit. That would make it to the end of the day. That would make it to the end of the week. Keep editing, make it to the end of the month. And then, yeah, eventually I finished with 120 um, phrases that I was really happy with. And I put them all together to see what, what could be done with it. Um, it turned out to be, and hold on with me because this is where it gets really weird. 96 phrases. The 96 phrases are divided by 12 chapters. Each chapter has eight pages. Each page is a phrase and an image. So that it is you, the third person, that completes what's happening in there. This one, for example, is called... I'm not crazy, I'm just trying to heal my soul. The way that I divided the, the novel is the first chapter is called the beginning and the last chapter is called the end. I am super smart, by the way. <laughs> the ten chapters in the middle are called one through ten. I'm telling you, I can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so the idea is that you can... Um, you always read the beginning. And then it's how you read the rest of the chapters that changes. Because the way that you live your life is completely different to the way that I live it. The experiences that you have are completely different to the experiences that I have. So therefore, we always come from somewhere and we're always going to die. That's just a given. But how we get there is the important part. Underneath every single one of your chairs, there is a copy of Unique. It is... A limited edition of this graphic novel. When you read it, I want you to look for two pieces of music. This is a 50-year project. Year one is a sculpture, a kinetic sculpture that I've made. Thanks to people that are here, Bob, Sean, Scott. It couldn't be done without you, Camilla, poor girl spend probably three months looking at 96 drawings trying to make sense out of them. The first format is now in the foyer. Format number two is now underneath your seats. And every single year, I'm going to keep on changing the format, not the story, to see what happens if in 50 years someone still has the same doubt that I have about myself. And every year I ask two brand new musicians to create music for it. So that the music that has been composed last year can still work with the piece that we've done in 48 years' time. Everything, every single thing feeds back to each other. Now, enough of me talking. This is a bit of unique.
So that's unique. I'm going to run through this one really quickly. Um, it's very clever. If you have a chance, go and see it. It's in the foyer. Um, I would love to talk to you about more, but otherwise I'm going to run out of time and someone's screaming in my ear. Um, so next up is, this is my friend Bruno Samborli, and Bruno's a genius. Bruno and I have been working together now for about four years. And uh, there we go. what Bruno made, which is amazing, is this thing called Mojis. And you're looking at him right there playing some sort of scaff. And what happens is that whenever he touches that scaff, the scaff creates a sound, which I can actually play every single instrument. According to what I want to do. I'm going to stay there and go on, boys. You should see some people around you that actually have some of this. Tell that everything is now reacting to me. And there's some people around you that are now playing with it too. I know what you're thinking. From a single little thing, I can control the entire environment. I have now given humans the possibility of creating their environment. You too, sir, behind you, there's someone playing your chair. You two over there, there's someone playing your chair. Someone else playing the chair over there. Now, not only are we controlling every single piece of light that you see here, but we're also controlling the video. For me, this is one of the greatest things that had ever happened in my life. All of a sudden, the world expanded. And a simple chair can become my instrument. A plate can create something new. A table. All these elements are now disposed for you to put in installations to put in the foyer of your place. I put it in my house to freak out my friends when they open the fridge. No, I just showed everybody up that way. <laughs> right. Um, I was going to spend a bit more time on that, but then... Um, yeah, I have a big sign that you have 10 minutes. And uh, I wanted to go through this because this is, for me, um, if you don't know me, this is, this is my baby. This is Nyeka. Nyeka comes from, basically, the deepest place in my life. <laughs> um, in 2006, I had the worst thing happen to a human being. I realized I was going to die. And from there, I started finding a way of how to express that. So, first way I did it is I started writing, thinking that this should be a bunch of sculptures. And then I thought, no, it should be etchings. Then I thought, no, it should be installations. Maybe it should be music. Maybe it should move. And then eventually it became performance. So the way that I wrote it, and this is going to freak everybody out, I had four pieces of paper. And I would write kind of what I wanted the story to be. And then I would jump to design. And then from design, I would jump to music. And from music, I would move to movement. And then movement would dictate the way the music had to re react. And then the music will make then what the story you should be. And then the story will actually make how the design needed to adapt to itself. And then the design will actually move all the way to the music and then take the music and make it to the movement. So all of a sudden, all the places of it are completely touched to each other. They're tight. My set was very easy, 13 screens, nine of them up and down. Um, the other four just movable around. Um, I had 15 dancers. The guys in the mask is Austin TV, don't be worried. Um, those are my musicians, I've been working with them for 12 years. The one in the middle is Nicole Robson, she's my arranger. And the woman at the back is Diana, she is a soprano from New York. 
Now, when I was writing all this whole thing, it's a really quick story, I had written the way that I wanted all the arrangements to be. And I sat down with Nicole and I said, Nicole, I think we have a problem. She went, why? I think, I think we need to lose a violin and get a harp. And she said, why? I said, read my new script and you'll realize it. She goes, no, no, but we can do a, you know, a pizzicato. And I was like, I don't want a pizzicato. I want a proper movement. Eventually, I said, read it. If you don't think it's right, we'll change it. Um, she called me two days later and said, yeah, we do need it. And I go, when did you figure out? It's like 30 minutes after you left. I just had too much pride to call you right away. <laughs> I had a children's choir, because let's be honest, everybody needs a children's choir. Um, but I also wanted to pick some craft. Uh, this is a jaguar head made out of 35,000 beads placed one by one individually by the great Charlie the Mindu. Um, the lighting on it, obviously, was very important. Um, it was a combination of LED fixtures and source for and, uh, tungsten fixtures, all of them always acting in terms of how I want to tell the story. I will only use warms for some reason, only calls for another reason. I will only use color in the last 30 seconds of the entire show. That's my storyboard. And for those who don't to make storyboards, it's amazing. It's great to talk to everybody. So I used to put the storyboard all the time and, and, and talk to the different people that were working with me so they could understand how I wanted to do things. So that's my storyboard. That's what it looked like. It was pretty close. It made the designers, the rest of my team, my associates, the uh, director, well, the choreographer, um, understand, and even the dancers understand what I was trying to get out of them. This is, oh, there you go. Um, this is another one of my drawings. I wanted to create a labyrinth, and once again, I just wanted to make to them and understand the quality of the light, how I wanted it, how I was looking at the person being lit the whole time. Ooh, keep fighting this thing. Um, that's what it looked like. That for me was one of the best scenes because it was the saddest thing I've ever seen in my life, which is a bunch of shadows that don't have an owner. Um, I always had this idea that my 15 dancers, there will always be one that will never be covered. And it's because he was taking the burden of human race. But we don't carry it by ourselves, we always pass it to someone else. So every single scene, that human would transform and be someone else. But in the meantime, you will go back to this shadow world. And when you went back to your shadows, you had your own light, your fourth chakra. So you can see in the middle of that drawing, there's a, a little lamp there. And uh, when, when, when I came up with this idea, Fernando, who's a choreographer, said, two pack is never going to work. And I said, why? Because you know, people are looking at dancers. And I was like, yeah, but at that point, the dance is the last thing that I'm worried about. It's all about the music and the feeling of light across an entire space. And before we got to that scene, there was uh, Renault finishes at the bottom of the stage, and then one of the shadow men comes behind them, and it's lit in tungsten front and back, three quarters, and they're having this beautiful sensual moment. And as the music is going, there's a little thing in the back that goes, boom, 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 tss. and on the tss, all the lights in the, the play in the room went off, and all you got was this 15 dancers clicking themselves on, and light coming out of them, and all the musicians that were at the back with all the lights on, and all of a sudden you realize that the entire place is lit out of human beings. A movement like that doesn't care. It's all about the movement there. It's all about your core. It's all about your center. This way it looked like. That's what it looked like. Um, I explained to a friend that I wanted to do that. He said, you're nuts. I said, you sure? He said, yeah. So I did that. Um, I wanted that dress to become my mother. I have mommy issues. Um, <laughs> um, you could tell who was a mom in the, in the audience because the moment that Scott comes to her and all, the single light that comes is from her dress and her covering him up, every mother in the room was crying. It was the lullaby of the mother finally saying, it's enough. Um, I will talk to you about more about this, but honestly, I'm like being harassed about finishing early. So come to the Q&A afterwards and we can talk more about it. Um, that's you. That was my costume design space, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, programming, I'll talk about this in the Q&A. My favorite bit about this picture is the top that says, everything inside of you is dying. <laughs> That's the feeling that I want to convey. That's Mooney, my associate, bless his heart. Um, video, I'm going to spend three seconds. I'm sorry, I'm going to run over about four minutes, but I need to talk about this because what we achieved in here Black tracks, for those who don't know it, for me, is the greatest thing we've ever invented. I made Gil and the Hippo guys sign 
a napkin after Plaza last, uh, in 2011 saying that they will do it because I challenged them that they couldn't do it. We all worked through Christmas, New Year's. We went into rehearsals and we weren't sure it could work. And then one day in rehearsals, after rewriting the SDK about 30 times, I'm doing an email and all I hear is, and it's Nigel going, you got to come out. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, in five minutes, you got to come out. No, yeah, in five minutes, two pack, you got to come out. And I come out, and from the top of my balcony, I see four screens that are moving without any single piece of automation. And the screens are moving, and the image is locked into it. And Nigel is looking at me going, you are insane. How did you know it was going to work? And I said, A, I have a big belief on you and on the rest of the team. Two, it's about time it happens. And three, I know our egos are so big that we will never let it fail. <laughs> um, video people, you've seen that shine plenty of times. Um, I also use low tech, like I said before. I have, I, I'm the proud owner of 10 overhead projectors, and slide projectors, and plasma projectors. I love low tech. My projectionist used to say they have these little things going. I always used them to play with it. I wanted them to be artists in the middle of the show, that they could convey something different every single time, not just video that could be reproduced. Finally, my puppets. That's what they look like. Um, just like I said, I'm just running through things right here. Um, we can talk about them later. Um, that's my team. It's 180 individuals that believed in me. I used to tell them every single morning, why are you here? <laughs> like, I know it's hard, and I've put them through hell to get to a wanted, but I'm proud to say that 180 people working together, 34 nationalities, trying to put them all, you think there's going to be a lot of fighting. The love that was in the air was absolutely incredible. I will love those 180 people for the rest of my life, no matter what happens. This project cost me my life. It pushed me to places that I'd never known before. But at the same time, I wouldn't be standing in front of you right now if it wasn't for all of them. For me, Nyeka is exactly that, the exact moment in which a flower blossoms. But enough of me talking. This is Nyeka.
Thank you very much. How about one more round of applause for Tupac? So it's now my great pleasure to officially say that the USITT 56th Annual Conference and Stage Expo is open. Have a great day.